We're going to kick it off to start with Graham Bettis. He is the Director of Field Operations for the TxDOT Bridge Division, overseeing the inspection program, big bridge construction and maintenance, and geotechnical branches, bridge data management, and for forensic investigations. He has 18 years of experience in structural design and forensic engineering for both buildings and bridges with a focus primarily on diagnosing problems and developing solutions for existing structures. So he's going to kick us off with talking about uh, it's flooding in Texas. I think we're partially to blame for at least one of those events because some of the water came down Louisiana side, made it through the Sabine and over into the southeastern part of Texas. Apologize for that. It's never a good sign, I think, when uh, you bring up the idea for a session about emergency response and everybody on the phone call gets really excited because they all have such good stories to share. Uh, it, it's, it's been a, a eventful few years for many of us, uh, particularly in the southeast. So um, we, we've learned some, some lessons, good and bad, um, and, and we thought it would be a good idea to maybe share some of those. The good news post-lunch is I think that these are going to be very heavy on photos, so uh, enjoy yourself. We'll try to spare you all the, the data and other things that, that tend to make us a little more tired. All right, so the title is Flooding Down in Texas. You're going to see in your brochure that it says lessons learned from five, six mass flood events in 13 months. I miscounted. Once I actually started looking at, at how many there were, we had six um, separate major flood events um, from May of 2015 to June of 2016. And, um, you know, my, my boss said at the end of last calendar year, he doesn't really know what we would have done with ourselves had it not been for flood response, because looking back, uh, for a large number of us, it really dominated everything that we did uh, around the state. So what you can see in the, the first photo there, um, for those familiar with Austin, that's, that's Stevie Ray Vaughan statue and we've got a series of dams in Austin. The Colorado River goes right through downtown so there's a series of dams to prevent flooding uh, from occurring. It's constant level and uh, you can see that that was not the case here but um, everybody in Austin was happy to see that the water came up just to the height that uh, Stevie is walking on water which uh, we all already knew to be the case. To give you a little background on, on what this was like for us, the, the map on the left there is uh, the drought monitor for um, 2014. And we were, we in multi, multi year, um, just almost no rain, pretty uh, dangerous situation, um, Ashley. And it, that had been going on for many years. And I think, uh, as with all other DOTs, we have a, a high rate of turnover. So when you have uh, lots of dry for a large number of years, you lose a lot of people that have had the experience with these kinds of events. And uh, th this case was no exception. So when the rains came and didn't stop, uh, many of us were just kind of learning on the run and doing what we could. So uh, we had ample opportunity to, to learn some, some things and thought I'd share that with you. And then the, the map on the right there shows kind of where we were early 2017 and where, where we are now. Now the separate events we had, Memorial Day 2015 was kind of the biggie. This was the one that made national news. Um, there were um, unfortunately multiple fatalities. Uh, massive, massive rain event. And it didn't, it only lasted a couple of days but um, it was just an absolute flash flood in a rocky hill country. And so it, was, it came and went quickly, but the, uh, the, the effects were um, pretty catastrophic. And beyond that, um, once we got past uh, May of 2015, throughout the summer in North Texas, it kept raining, had another massive uh, two or three day event in Halloween in 2015. Had a little bit of a break there for a few months, but then um, this was really four, five, and six there were very nearly a sustained event. Um, started raining spring break, mid-March in 2016, especially in East Texas, uh, Beaumont, Houston areas. Um, Louisiana shared some of our misery there. Uh, sustained rain events, April, May, and June 2016. And this was just a nightmare for, for many of the districts. Uh, in terms of fatigue and, and just trying to deal with this ongoing problem. Uh, and then in June 2016, Central Texas got hit again. So uh, it, it, it was a lot of rain in 13 months and it really uh, wreaked a lot of havoc. Just to give you kind of an idea of where we were in Austin, the, the reservoir 
uh, Lake Travis, just west of Austin. You can see there, uh, down at near 620 feet, it's essentially a river again. It's, it's the, the uh, original river channel. There's not much of a lake there. And then when the rains came on Memorial Day, it went from, from 625 all the way up to um, 670 and kept going. So it gained 50 feet in a very, very short time. And then you see there Halloween 2015. And just to give you an idea, here's Fool Pool right here. Um, there wasn't really any time to, to get the water down to where we needed it. And so then Memorial Day 2.0 in 2016, more rain, and uh, we didn't need it um, at the time. We'd been desperate for rain for years, couldn't get it. And then once the faucet uh, turned on, we couldn't turn it back off. Back to Memorial Day 2015. This is, these are areas, um, in and around Austin, very rocky, uh, very prone to flash floods. And so this is the area where we saw the most severe damage to bridges. Uh, we saw a lot of bridges overtopped. We saw superstructures picked up um, and hurled down river. Uh, and this, this bridge here, if, if you do remember the news, this one was, was very well known because there was a house that was picked up from the bank um, while it was occupied and uh, hurled down river and, and hit a bridge. And, um, Fortunately, five, five, all five people in the house uh, were killed as a result. Um, but th this is really, the, the flash floods is where we ran into severe, severe problems with the bridges. Now, I did want to show here on the bottom right, um, uh, that the superstructure got picked up, hurled down river, and set on the bank. And you can see, I mean, it looks like it's a span ready to pick up and put back on the bridge. So I just kind of wanted to highlight how resilient um, our multi-girder bridges can be. I think whatever we analyze and, and think the capacity is, uh, it's, it's actually far greater than that. So we were all um, happy to see that our superstructure did, did hold up in this fashion. So I wanted to talk about lessons learned. We, we did some things right, we did some things wrong. And once the rains did stop in June 2016, a few months later, my boss asked me to, to sit down and really consider all the events and what happened, and let's get some let, let's get this down in writing, so maybe we're not caught so off guard, and, and we've got these lessons down. So I spent a lot of time actually going through this and, and working with visiting with different district people and people within the division to get an idea of uh, what we did and, and what we should be doing moving forward. So one of the things that we did well right off the bat, I think, was establish a bridge-specific command center. I think most of the DOTs will have an overall command center set up, and this is with the DMV and uh, the, the larger state effort. We found that having a bridge-specific command center was very effective. Uh, one of the parts of that is when you know a storm is coming, uh, identify personnel. I mean, if it's a Friday and there's a storm scheduled to hit on Sunday, make sure you've identified a sufficient number of people uh, that will be available, know that they have to have their phone on them, uh, no booze, uh, that kind of thing. They need to be ready to respond at a moment's notice. Um, not everyone gets to go in the field. This was an interesting time for me. I had just got in my current position when this first flood hit, and uh, I was in the parking lot with a set of keys walking to a truck, and my boss caught me and uh, turned me around and said, no, 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 you're, uh, you're upstairs. So. Um, it, we all want to be in the field, uh, but a few capable uh, people need to stay behind and, and operate a command center so the, those out in the field have somebody to rely on. Uh, and, and really, we found that to be very effective to have three or four people um, in a bridge-specific command center to direct the field team so they can just focus on their evaluations. Uh, so we, there, we were there um, querying data uh, from the bridge data management system. Uh, generating maps was very, very effective to be able to send these KMZ files on Google Maps um, out to the guys so they, they knew where they needed to go. Uh, we were there to prioritize structures for evaluation, which ones do we need to really focus in on. Um, and then something that we did later on in one of the last events was actually set that command center up um, in the district office where the, the emergency was happening. Uh, and that helped a lot, and I'll, I'll touch on, on why that was so effective a little bit later. Um, but, but having regular um, communication with the district and other authorities in the area, uh, allowing even better the field teams to focus on the evaluations, and then proximity. If you've got a couple of experts that are running the command center, somebody goes out and sees a really, really severely damaged bridge, then they're in, they're in the area already and can go take a look at that. 
Uh, let's see, communication devices. Uh, cell towers go down during these things, so having radios or walkie-talkies uh, around, very important. And then when you do have cell service, uh, we started using more and more FaceTime uh, to actually show experts that were in another area uh, just turn the phone around and say, look, how, how big a deal is this? And um, it, it sounds simple, and it is, but we found it to be an extremely effective tool uh, to allow our, our experts, uh, whether it be geotechnical or, or structural, whatever, to see what's going on as it's happening. Uh, we also started use, utilizing applications to uh, track the team location. It's hard to keep track of everybody when you have multiple teams out there. So whether Google Maps has, an, uh, has uh, something where you can track by phone and then find my friends, whatever that is. Apparently, uh, that, that was an effective tool. Um, very important to account for fatigue. And we found this out in the central Texas flooding where, it, where it's hilly and you have flash floods and it, it's horrible for a couple of days, but then it's over with. That's not such an issue. But in East Texas, where we had ongoing for weeks and in one case months flood events, um, fatigue starts to set in. Uh, and you really have to force these guys to rest when needed. Um, appreciate the fact that it's not just time, but it's, it can be extremely stressful while they're out in the field and, um, during prolonged responses. In the, the Houston prolonged flooding, we, had, we were having two emergency calls a day, one at 9 in, in the morning and one at 3 in the afternoon. And this went on for weeks. And it was really interesting to see how things deteriorated, not just with our personnel, but with the public and reports that we were getting from, from near fist fights, out at traffic closures, and people just get tired and, and they start making bad decisions. And you really have to account for that and, and whenever possible, get some reinforcements and force these guys to rest. They're all, all very gung-ho and they want to be out there, but sometimes you just got to force them to, to cut it out. Uh, lesson number two, don't get ahead of yourself. And this is one that we did learn because this is not what we did the first couple of events. Um, we all know hurricanes can shift dramatically. Storms can shift dramatically too. The Memorial Day 2015, uh, we, were all, we all had our meeting on Friday because we knew the storm was going to hit Sunday. And we were all prepared to report to Houston because that's where the storm was supposed to hit. Um, it shifted dramatically um, several hundred miles to the west. And so don't, don't get too carried away trying to set up for a specific area. Be prepared to respond, but, but uh, the storm can shift just like a hurricane can. This was a big one for us. So Memorial Day, we, we were fired up, man. We were ready. We had, we had seven teams put together, and it was really admirable, and it was really kind of a proud moment for us that we had so many people willing to come in on a holiday weekend to the point where we, haven't, we had to turn people away and say, look, we, we've got enough. We've got our seven teams. Um, we don't need anybody else, but the, we had a large number of people that were ready to come in on the holiday, and uh, we sent them all out. So we had seven teams out, and we evaluated, I can't remember how many dozens of bridges in the first couple of days. And what you find out, there's really nothing you can evaluate um, to be out there while, while it's ongoing. And you know, what I, what I put in the, in the photo there is like, yeah, it's flooded. That's uh, in a lot of cases about all, all we can do uh, to get out there. So. Just kind of hold your horses. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do until the water starts to recede. Um, now that doesn't apply to scour, and scour really, I think, is where it, I, we. I think everybody in the room knows if you're going to lose a bridge, um, it's almost always going to be due to scour. And so, focusing on the scour critical structures and going and evaluating those. But the the normal structures, uh, it, the vast majority of them don't sustain damage. Um, in, in one case, a, a county asked us to go evaluate 43 separate structures, and out of 43, we found one that had sustained some moderate damage, and the other 42 were fine. So uh, most of these bridges do pretty well. There's not a whole lot we can see right off the bat anyway. Uh, but you do need to be prepared. As soon as that water starts receding, you need to be ready to roll. Uh, lesson number three, initial evaluations. This is another area where we kind of shifted how we handled it um, as we went through the course of these six events. Uh, initially, we were using our subject matter experts, our, our really top geotechnical and structural guys to go do the evaluations. And they were spending an enormous amount of time evaluating structures that weren't damaged. Um, and, and what we learned was most of them don't get damaged, and it's much better off to get your experts focused on the bridges where damage is identified 
And the way that we started doing that was we started directing initial investigations that could be performed by others. And for TxDOT, that typically meant district maintenance personnel. They need to be out there anyway, ensuring that the roadways and bridges are safe uh, to, to stay open. And so what we did is put a checklist together and gave that to them and say, look, while you're there, check for these things. And in that way, we were able to, to identify the structures that had sustained damage. And then we sent our subject experts there to, uh, to do a more in-depth investigation. But, um, really, we, we found that to be far better use of, of time and efforts to send the experts to the damage to the bridges where damage was identified. Scour critical is an exception. Your, your geotechnical experts need to be the ones evaluating those, and I'll touch a lot more on scour before this is over. I'm not going to read through this, but this is the checklist we went through. We, we kept it as, as brief as possible, and I know that's not that brief, but th these are just kind of the highlights. While you're out here, person not used to bridge inspections, look for this kind of stuff. And it really helped us to, to uh, quickly evaluate large numbers of structures. Lesson number four, effective communication. Um, I already touched on the idea of the, the overall command control center. Just because we have a bridge uh, specific command center doesn't mean we don't participate in the, the overall command center. And we found it to be, be very helpful to have our administration, our maintenance uh, folks, our bridge folks, the DMV, um, uh, the police, everybody working together and communicating regularly. Uh, and then the regular conference calls were another really effective tool. Just getting together, whether it's only 20, 30 minutes a day or twice a day sometimes, um, and, and they would just kind of go through a roll call and everybody would provide their, their little update. And uh, really effective, just kind of, kind of keep everybody on the same page. Um, Field response. Time is of the essence. The, uh, the list of bridges to evaluate can be very long, and this is something we're still trying to figure out, is how do we identify the, the truly uh, critical structures? And it, it's easier said than done. Uh, but really, the idea that the Bridge Command Center is going to do the legwork and allow the field folks to, to stay focused um, on, their, on their job out in the field. They shouldn't be having to stop to query data on their own and do any of this stuff. We need them rolling. So bridge evaluation, when they finish that, they're ready to roll to the next one because they've got somebody doing um, all the boring computer stuff in the office. Um, also, we found that districts, they, they like to have uh, safety meetings and tailgate meetings and things like that, and that's very, very important, but it can cripple you in terms of productivity if we have all of our personnel attending every one of those meetings. So what we did is identify the, the one or two leads that could participate in those tailgate and safety meetings first thing in the morning while our, our teams are already out on their way to the evaluations. And then our team leads would communicate uh, the most important info from those meetings. But having our guys drive into a district office to attend a tailgate meeting um, really um, severely limited the number of bridges we were able to hit. So um, let a couple guys handle that and let your field teams do their thing. Uh, let's see here. Maps. This was, this was a great tool and this was new to me. And uh, um, my friend to the left here from Louisiana will recognize maybe the Sabine River there. But generating KMZ files, uh, very easy to query data and generate a KMZ file and import that into to Google Earth and makes it much easier for the field teams to know. First of all, it helps us in the command center to know where the bridges are that we really need to evaluate. And then we're able to deliver this info to, to the field teams. Um, that allows a couple of things. Not only can they see the bridges they, they need to hit, but we're able to, to group it by geographic region. Uh, early on, we were generating lists um, um, prioritized by criticality and a field team would hit a bridge here and then they would go to the next uh, bridge and that could be across the district and uh, there were two or three other bridges that needed to be hit before they left the area. So uh, grouping geographically, not just by criticality, uh, making sure we hit all the bridges while they're in an area uh, helped to expedite things. Effective communication still, traffic control. This was a biggie and um, we don't presume to tell the, those that are setting up traffic control what their job is. Um, we, we rely on them to do that. What we found was that this, this differed significantly from district to district. And so my suggestion to, to all of you and what we'll do moving forward is, is um, 
communicating exactly what the intent and duration will be. We were in a district and they set up full traffic control for us at every bridge, which can take over two hours to do. And really all we're trying to get up there and do is a, a, a measure the channel profile, which is, you know, in most cases a 10, 15, 20 minute activity. And uh, we weren't able to hit many bridges because we had these elaborate traffic control setups. And so we're actually working with our traffic division now to get a standard procedure in place. It allows for an adequate level of traffic control, but not overly elaborate, because we can't afford to be spending uh, two hours for traffic control on one bridge. We wouldn't hit anything. Oh, something that worked really well in Houston. They, they actually set up two traffic control teams and allowed us to leapfrog. And man, we were flying through those bridges. That was, that was a really, really effective tool to have complete, two completely separate traffic control teams, one working with us on a bridge, the other one was on the next bridge setting up. And uh, we were able to move just as quickly as, uh, as we could. So very effective there. Uh, lesson number five, setting some standard procedures. Like I said, this was new to a lot of us. And then for those uh, in the districts that, not, that aren't used to doing bridge inspections, they're even less used to it. And so we're in the process right now of preparing uh, a set of standard operating procedures. And we're aiming for short. We don't want these guys to have to read novels uh, during an emergency response. So we're aiming for one page, just kind of a bullet list. Here's what you need to do. And uh, I, I won't read through it, but just th th that's kind of what we're keying in on, those, those bullets there. So. It allows people to understand what the expectations are and, and how to actually do it. Establishing statewide spanners. Man, th this, this was a major lesson for us. And I don't know what it's like in the other DOTs, but uh, we have really focused in on the need to, um, to, to set some statewide standards. Because what happened was when we were trying to determine bridge uh, criticality, susceptibility to catastrophic damage, especially with Scour, we found that uh, various districts had very, very different criteria for doing that. And um, the tendency is to be conservative, right? I, I, especially when you don't know. So what we got were extremely conservative criteria. Um, and I'll, I'll show you this list. We asked one district to provide us we said, we have our list of bridges we think we need to hit in your district, but we want to cross-check it with yours. Could you provide us with your list of bridges we need to hit? Um, they sent us a spreadsheet um, with 1,100 and true structures. So, I mean, uh, not, not, not a whole lot we can do with that, right? What we're really trying to do is identify the four or five that could truly come down. And so th this list really didn't do us a whole lot of good. Scour, good grief, we have wildly different criteria for what deems a structure scour critical. And um, the structure there in the photo, this is, uh, this is US 59, which is essentially an interstate just outside of Houston over the San Jacinto River. And this was a scour critical bridge. And it was a Saturday afternoon. And we went and did a channel profile measurement and found that there was 14 feet of scour with this event. And uh, about three of us were on a conference call and man, I needed to go grab the puke bucket because I thought I was gonna have to call the district and say, shut this bridge down, which would have been a huge, huge deal. And we were very much on the verge of doing that. <clears throat> but before we did, we were able to, one of, one of our geotech people took it upon themselves to, to dig through the plans and determine that there was another 43 feet of embedment, even with the 14 feet of uh, scour. So obviously we don't have a problem, but we came this close to, to closing a major bridge. And that's how we figured out that this district used a criteria of if there has been three feet of scour or more, then a bridge is automatically scour critical. That doesn't matter if you have six feet of embedment or 80 feet of embedment. It's a problem, right? So conservatism is good and over conservatism is, is not so good. Um, so we, we are now working to have a statewide criteria that actually makes sense and allows us to identify the truly critical structures. Um, this is a tough one, lesson number seven. Good. Okay. You got to be willing to make difficult decisions. Um, and again, there, there are serious ramifications to closing roadways. So th this was a tough one. This was another one that made us sort of sick to our stomach. This is I-35 over the Red River. And we had an engineer standing there watching the water come up. And uh, you know, sure enough, it starts getting into the superstructure. 
And uh, we, you can see in the, well, you can see in the photo here, it's, it's open. Um, but back in the, the background there, you can see where the channel is and the superstructure is still essentially out of the water. This area where the, the debris is building up is out of the channel. So we, we found that wide floodplain, slow moving water, um, we could go ahead and keep it open. This was a tough one too. This is a, a deck truss and um, that's quite a field of debris there. And we did have to close this one temporarily, but then the water receded to the point where the, the deck truss was still underwater. But this is a lake, um, very slow moving water. Uh, we got some divers in to look what they, at what they could. But this was another tough one. Do we, do we leave it closed or do we open it? And we ultimately decided to open it and it, it was all fine. But um, that, that's not a, it's not a decision that makes you feel real good, but um, you, you, gotta, you gotta go out on the edge of that plank just a little bit. You gotta do what, what's responsible um, and, and sometimes that means making a, a tough decision. There it is once it was completely out of the water, which will make you appreciate just how high that water was. Lesson number eight, effective scour evaluation. Um, Got to look out for that second scour event. A lot of times we go out and evaluate for scour while the water's still up and it's had the first scour event when the flood came. A lot of times, and especially shallow water, that second scour event when the water recedes can be just as severe. Um, so really you, you need in most cases to do a second evaluation. I got to be very careful about divers. You can't get divers into this water when there's debris. Uh, so using depth detection devices, which is usually, you know, we use fancy fish finders attached to a floaty device, and uh, it's rudimentary, but, <laughs> but, it, but it actually works really, really well, believe it or not. We used to attach them to fishing poles, but we stopped doing that because, uh, you know, we had guys out on the out on, uh, uh, bridge doing that and the reporters out there taking photo of them fishing. Range poles, yeah, I think there's, it doesn't have to be anything terribly fancy. There's lots of tools out there. I tell you, man, we have gotten to love underwater side scan sonar in the last couple of years. This is a very effective tool, uh, something that we didn't use a whole lot of before these flood events, but we love it. Um, so we're really expanding the use of it. Um, this is a, a truss over the Red River that you can see in the photo and really gives you a good idea. Um, this is a a footing supported structure, no piling. So when we start seeing exposed footing, uh, it really allows us to, yeah, it's a problem, right? And you know, this was interesting too. This was a, a larger, a longer bridge, but just kind of going down the bents, you can see how much it varies along the channel, but there's a big chunk of exposed footing. There's a whole bunch of debris. Um, now we're getting into exposed footings and then you have the next bent where you've actually got aggradation. Um, so just really interesting info there. Uh, let's see, bridge approaches really don't like water. Man, did we have a big uh, uh, debris problem. And the water spreads, and especially when the debris clogs the openings, the water goes around to the edges. And um, oftentimes, even when we have decent riprap or something else, it just doesn't hold up uh, to these water flows. So we found that while bridges held up, um, in almost all cases, we had a lot of pretty significant problems at the approaches. And this is where a majority of our problems were. Um, a lot of times these, the, the abutments are built well outside the, the channel to a point where we never really thought they would see water, but um, we had, I can't remember how many 500 year events, it became kind of a joke, I think we had three 500 year events in uh, 13 months. Uh, here's another one, bridge is fine, but the, uh, the approach certainly is not. I like this photo a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, that, that is an abutment not a bent. So um, our bridge did great. So if this is a bridge preservation conference, I guess we can say success. Um, the approach completely washed out, obviously, but um, we saw a whole lot more of this. We, we, we had a few catastrophic bridge failures. We had a whole lot of approaches uh, wash out. Here's some more bank erosion. Um, the water, just, it was amazing. Here was one, um, anybody from Texas or Austin will, will you hear Onion Creek and you, you know what that means. It's, uh, it floods and floods and floods and floods over and over again. And you can see some concrete aprons here that we had put from a previous event, the exposed drill shaft there, and it didn't work. Um, so we got some more um, erosion around the drill shafts. Same deal there. Um, it's hard to stop water. Lesson 10, damage isn't always obvious. Uh, there, we, there we go with the debris again. Um, you can see some, some columns that have completely failed there. 
And you can see there's not much deformation in the deck. It held up. Uh, same thing with this one. And actually no deformation whatsoever in this deck. And so we're sitting here looking at the photo from the underside. You know the damage is bad. Uh, there have been cases where we didn't know there was this level of damage until the routine bridge inspection, which may have been a year later. So after the event, after the, the first initial response, have your maintenance guys go out and poke their head underneath all the bridges along these flooded walkways, because it's amazing the degree of damage. And our bridges are very resilient, which is a beautiful thing, um, but sometimes they're so resilient that we don't know that catastrophic damage has occurred. All right, I'll go quick. Um, debris sucks. We don't know what to do about it. It's a major problem. Um, if anybody has any ideas, please let us know. It's just, it just, it just stinks. We have so much of it and we don't have a, a good mechanism in place to, to get rid of it. Um, I, I'm not joking there on the bottom. What not to do. Um, we, you know, don't, don't get diesel and pour it on top and set it on fire. I think our Georgia friends will, will second that. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, and then we've had, had maintenance crews go and, and put the crane or, or bucket um, on one side, pick it up, and, you know, just put it on the other side, and, you know, then it goes down to the next bridge, and we do the same thing there. Get it, pick it up and get it on the bank. I know, easier said than done. Um, here, here's some more major debris. You can see that our columns and piling don't like that. Uh, big debris field there. Uh, it's totally clogged the superstructure on this one. Um, I'll be brief here. Equipment and tools, keep the stuff readily available. Depth detection devices, we had these things called shy flows. Um, it was a water ski with a fish finder on it, and they worked pretty well, but we made them, what, David, in the 90s? And um, they worked really well, but when you go years be between floods, um, everybody forgets that they're there. Um, they kind of go into disrepair. Nobody knows how to use them, and we found that especially be the case here. So make sure that you've not only got the equipment you need to respond, but there are people around that know how to use it. All right, a few design considerations here. Um, shear keys, good. Uh, we like them. They work well in almost all cases, so uh, we've made it pretty standard practice. If there is any likelihood that a superstructure will be inundated, put a shear key in. Shear walls, not always so good. They work beautifully as long as the water cooperates, but water never cooperates. So if the water is moving parallel to the shear wall, it's beautiful, but over the life of the structure, that channel is going to shift, and uh, that shear wall becomes a, a debris catcher. Tie beams, usually good. We love tie beams. Um, it, it, it's amazing how much they add um, to the capacity of a superstructure, I'm sorry, substructure and limit damage, whether it's vehicular impact or debris impact or anything else. Those suckers help a lot, and they don't catch debris. David, I know I'm out of time here. Um, hydrographs, if you don't know them, I would, I would encourage you to get to know hydrographs. This was another very effective tool. Um, gives you uh, very accurate um, not only shows what the water has done, but what it's going to do over the next few days. We're working with the USGS, yeah, hopefully, what he said is hopefully, and we're actually working with National Weather Service and USGS right now to uh, drastically increase the number of gauges we have on bridges because we all are interested in having more accurate um, um, info and opportunities to predict because knowing what the water is going to do, where it's going to crest, uh, very, very important. Um, same deal here. Wanted to show this one. This was the this was in Wimberley. This was the one where the, the bridge got taken out, and you can see it, we were at, at five feet. Uh, major flood is at 26 feet. We we went to 40 feet um, in just not much more than about an hour. Um, so it was really like truly catastrophic flash flood. Uh, if anybody's interested, I can talk to you after on this. Um, somebody mentioned Bailey Bridge earlier. Having an inventory of temporary bridges can be very effective. Uh, we had one district that was able to very, very quickly on their own, with their own maintenance crew, get a temporary bridge put up and open to traffic in less than 14 hours. This was interesting. A couple of years ago, we were reading our little internal propaganda magazine, whatever you want to call it, and uh, we found this advertisement, um, how proud we were that we had somebody had recycled all this structural steel. And we looked at the photos, like, that's our, that's our Bailey Bridge. And uh, somebody had recycled it without telling us. So um, we didn't have that bridge anymore. 
uh, lots of consultants called and offering to help during these events, take them up on it. Um, we've got a lot of experts out there. Many of them are former DOT employees that still are truly invested in, in what's right for the state. So find a way to take these guys up on it. Don't try to keep it all um, internal. And then maintaining a list of contractors uh, that are able to very quickly mobilize and, and help you with these situations. And very important that we get these bridges um, opened as quickly as possible. Um, I'm going to skip over these, except I want to show you the, the Burr's Ferry. I'm, very, very quickly, the aftermath, just a couple bridges on how we address those. This, was, this is a truss bridge over the Sabine River crossing into uh, Mr. Miller's territory in Louisiana. This, was a, this is a repeat offender. You can see we had some really hefty repairs already there. Um, and we already said water doesn't do what we think it's going to do. It's going to do what it wants. So this one made a, it, the river made a beeline right here. And it was really interesting. You can see the truss here. So the, the bent in the foreground just got completely um, washed out and scoured. The one here on the Louisiana side, like nothing. It was fine. And that's actually where the main, <laughs> good. Yeah, our Louisiana friends um, planned it so Texas got all the damage. But it was really interesting that one bent, we had to go, we had to put this massive repair in, and the one next to it, we didn't have to do anything. Um, the, the gentleman laughing on the bottom right there is the one who designed this. Um, we, we got a chuckle. This was a huge repair. I mean, I think it was something like 300 cubic yards of concrete. It's hard to appreciate from the photo. Um, but we had to go outside of the previous repair, so it's not going anywhere. My last point, um, and I'll get out of here. Um, simplified scour repair. This was a bridge in the Waco district where uh, we were down to six feet of embedment, so we closed it. But we recognize that we've got bedrock, maybe there's an opportunity to do a simple repair here. In a lot of areas of the state, six feet of embedment means we're either underpinning or we're ripping it out and building a new bridge. We saw an opportunity here, we did a load test, established we had sufficient axial capacity, um, all we needed was sufficient lateral, and so we were able to design a, a fairly rudimentary repair, which was put a bunch of big rocks around the columns. That's not something that we would do in most cases, because it usually just washes away again, but I uh, really took a look at this one and found that a very easy repair that was able to be handled in-house, uh, we were able to very quickly, inexpensively get this bridge opened, when in a lot of cases we would have uh, shut it down. So there's opportunities to evaluate. And like I said, you've got to be an engineer about this. Um, you can't always do the things that you would typically do, and uh, you've got to kind of walk out on the, the limb a little bit. Um, I doubt we have time for questions. Does anybody have anything? I'll be around all week, so I'd be glad to discuss any of this with you if you have anything. All right, thanks, Graham. Thank you.